The financial implications of e-prescribing, stumbling blocks for e-prescribing and EMR adoption, looming deadlines for technology implementation. How can practices leverage new technologies to receive economic incentives? And what will happen to practices that can't or won't make the leap to an electronic office? Join us to find out. In the Know starts now. Welcome to In the Know, your source for insight and analysis on the issues that matter to our dynamic healthcare market. I'm your host, Gina Clark. Today, we complete our discussion on the reimbursement challenges and opportunities facing oncology practices. We will talk about specific requirements that practices must meet to qualify for short-term incentives, as well as what practices can do in the public policy arena to influence their longer-term future. Joining us for part two of our discussion is Bobby Buell, Principal for On Point Oncology and a nationally recognized expert in oncology coding. Thanks for staying with us today, Bobby. Thank you, Gina. The Physician Quality Reporting Initiative, or PQRI, is changing to PQRS, the Physician Quality Reporting System. Other than the name change, what else changes with this program for 2011? Well, the government, in order to encourage more people, has changed the guidelines a bit. Also, of course, it's being made easier, but it's being made cheaper at the same time. We're going down to a 1% incentive this year, and we're ratcheting down until there are penalties uh, in 2015. So people really need to get with this, and Medicare continuously makes it easier. Some of the things that may are a little bit easier this year is, of course, there are always more measures. Uh, so everybody should check the measures carefully and make sure that they understand what applies to them. Uh, there are more EMR uh, ways to report uh, to the PQRS system. I think in 2012 we'll start seeing the advent of PQRS and meaningful use overlapping. Uh, if you submit by claims this year, it used to be that you had to be at 80% of three measures. This year, you only have to be at 50% of three measures. There are two group practice options if you would like to report as a group practice. One is GIPRO-1 if you're over 200 physicians, which nobody in oncology is because U.S. oncology doesn't report as a unit. Uh, and GIPRO-2, which is for smaller practices, anybody between 2 and 199. The only problem for oncology practices is that some of the measures you have to report as a group practice don't apply to oncology, but for those oncology clinics that are part of multi-specialty, they may want to look into that. They also have a few new oncology measures, nothing significant, uh, but it is still easier to report. You can report for a 12-month period, you can report for a six-month period, you can report through claims, and again, that's been made easier, or through a registry or through an EMR. So I think that it, it, PQRI, PQRS is becoming much more accessible. Also, we're becoming much more successful at it as a specialty. In the second quarter of 2010, uh, there was a 98% compliance rate for the breast cancer measure. So you can see that practices are starting to really get it and really report well. So if people aren't reporting, they should really start now. Again, based on your experience and discussions with the practices, what percentage of practices are taking full advantage of these incentives? And what can be done to further encourage them in this area? Well, when I did a study in Northern California, only about 35 to 40 percent of practices were taking advantage of it. Now, that was two years ago. I think we're up around 60 or 70 percent, but I certainly don't think we're at 100. Uh, I haven't done a survey about this lately, but maybe it's something I should do. But I don't think it's higher than 65, 60, 65 percent, just gut feeling. So, going from incentives to penalties, 2011 is supposed to be the year before penalties will be enacted for practices that don't use e-prescribing. Do you expect this deadline will retain its teeth when 2012 rolls around? I don't know because I actually think it's somewhat questionably legal. First of all, you're requiring practices to report whether they participate in the incentive, well, not practices, actually each provider, to report when they aren't going to get the incentive. 
uh, you can't uh, you can't participate in both meaningful use and e-prescribing in the same year. So you might decide the meaningful use incentive is much more useful to your practice since EMRs are quite expensive, and yet you still have to have every provider report on e-prescribing. When the original law was passed, basically they were going to look into Part D uh, prescriptions to see who was e-prescribing and whether you were in compliance and you didn't have to do anything. Now you actually have to report. The other issue is that you are going to be penalized based on the first half of 2011. Uh, and that wasn't in the original law either. The penalty was supposed to be a assessed in 2012. So this is why all specialty societies are actually questioning it. That and the fact that you have to report by claims. Uh, all specialty societies are appealing it, including ASCO and the MGMA. What are the most common mistakes or stumbling points for practices that want to participate in Medicare initiatives for e-prescribing or electronic health records? Well, e-prescribing isn't that difficult because you, on an annual basis, you only have to report 25 claims for certain visit codes with the visit code and the G8553 on the claim symbolizing that at least one prescription during that particular visit, the one you're billing for, were uh, done by an, a qualified e-prescribing system. So if you have a qualified e-prescribing system and you use it 25 times in that year and for each provider and you report on that, you're in compliance. I don't think that's as difficult as PQRI. PQRI, now PQRS, has very difficult co coding parameters and they often tweak them every year. And that can make you out of compliance with your 80 or 50 percent, depending on how you're submitting claims. Uh, that's why it's advantageous to do, use a registry sometimes if you don't really understand the coding requirements because so, they can help you out. And also, also you can do it retroactively, which is a little bit easier. EHR, the toughest thing right now, is to get a qualified system. There's only one system right now that's qualified for the EHR incentive, or sometimes known as the HIT incentive, the Meaningful Use Incentive, uh, and that is Altos. Oncology EMR. Other systems used in oncology are not yet accredited. So you might not be able to try for meaningful use this year anyway if your vendor has not participated yet. Um, you only have to participate in meaningful use for 90 days this year, and you have to attest to it on the Medicare EHR registry site. Um, and you only have to do 90 days next year, whatever your first payment year is. After 2012, they haven't exactly set. So it's not that hard. The biggest thing is to go to your vendor and make sure that you are participating in the core measures, the menu measures, and the QA measures through your system and that you are able to for 90 days. And then, of course, that your vendor is accredited. Do you have best practices you can share in this area in terms of selection and implementation of the tools all the way to data capture and reporting? Really, the best practice is to sit down with your vendor and go through uh, the, these measures, and there's lists of them and checklists of them on the CMS website and on the EHR websites, that you can go through those checklists very easily and see if your system is doing it and if you're using those options within your EHR. A lot of people have just whiz-bang EHRs, but they're only using about half of it. And actually, uh, there was just a recent survey done by, I think it was HIMSS, which, which is the hospital uh, IT management group, that basically said physician systems were much more in compliance than hospital systems, which is amazing because hospital systems cost a lot more. So what you need to do is go through these checklists, make sure that you're using the options in your system, and then make sure that your vendor can generate reports for these because uh, even though you're only you're not transmitting data this year you're only attesting to the fact that you're using meaningful use you have to keep the records that you could do all of these things for six years uh, past the date that you actually apply for the incentive so it's important that you are able to generate these reports and you have a record of it so where else might there be opportunities for new revenue that practices may not be looking at right now? 
Well, I just completed a study on um, dispensing orals within your practice, having a, a pharmacy that dispenses oral cancer drugs and supportive care drugs. And many people now are becoming very successful at this. It's really becoming a revenue center in their office rather than just a convenience for patients. And it certainly is a convenience for patients. But people have to manage their pharmacies, their dispensing pharmacies in a certain way. First of all, some states won't allow you to do it, but second of all, you really have to treat this like a retail pharmacy uh, by hiring people in that area that have actual retail experience or hiring people in your practice to manage it that actually have retail experience and then managing to capture as many prescriptions in your practice as you possibly can uh, through your EHR and e-prescribing systems. What do you expect the rest of 2011 to bring to the reimbursement landscape? especially with a Republican House trying to push its agenda? Well, one agenda that everybody agrees on is getting money back from people that have charged the Medicare program incorrectly. And there are so many audit programs now, I think people have to be very wary of these. Uh, because right now we're going through this MUE thing, medically unlikely edits, which I call the medically unbelievable edits, um, where they're taking money back from units of drugs, including FDA approved uh, indications. So there are all these different take backs, audits, coding audits, these kinds of things. You have to make sure that in your practice you're not doing something where you're going to lose a whole bunch of money because there are not many oncology practices that can really afford to lose a lot of money in an, in an audit. And remember, they assess interest and penalties. Even if you self-report uh, based on the anti-kickback statute or something like that to the OIG, they take it back an average of one and a half times whatever you owe them. How can practices get more involved in the public policy process to ensure their voices are heard by those forming and changing reimbursement guidelines? Well, I think it really depends on the preferences of your practice. Uh, some practices would like to get involved directly with their legislators, and that's certainly a thing to do, have a legislator come to your practice and see how cancer practices work, and really tell them, you know, for, an, for a chemotherapy infusion, this is what I get paid. This is what my expense is, because nobody breaks even on those drug administration codes. They just don't. Um, so you can have a direct experience with your legislators yourself. You can go through ASCO. You can go through COA. Certainly through your state manager society or your state physician society, you can get involved. Uh, get involved through your distributor. There are all kinds of ways to get involved. Many practices are getting involved in all ways. Uh, and that's an important thing to do because, you know, protecting our drug administration revenue as well as, you know, voting for things like the prompt pay, which is a, a, an initiative that COA and ABSG have in Congress to get rid of the prompt pay discount to drugs, which would actually mean a little bit more reimbursement for everybody. Get involved. It's very important because oncology has been a focal point, and it is going to be a focal point of the RACs and these MUEs all year long. So we have to be involved at all times. As always, Bobby, great information. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Gina. And thank you for joining us. We'll be back soon with an all-new episode. Until then, if it's on your mind, it's in the know.